Robert Cook, a president of King's College, once related a true story from the early years of his ministry. Evidently, at that time, he'd been receiving some rather pointed criticism. In fact, it had become of such great concern to him that he sought the counsel of a friend and beloved Bible expositor, Pastor Harry A. Ironside. Pouring out his heart, Bob Cook asked what he should do about the denunciations being made against him. He wanted to know how to handle him, and Ironside gave the following counsel. Bob, if the criticism about you is true, mend your ways. If it isn't, forget about it. The problem is, when it comes to something like betrayal, it's more than just being exposed or someone turning your back on. It's a bitter pill to swallow when somebody you trust takes that trust that is sometimes hard won and reluctantly given and then destroys it. Man, that's hard to get over. The psalmist wrote this, Yea, my own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat of my bread, had lifted up his heel against me. Our passage this morning articulates the betrayal of the perfect Son of God by one of his closest friends. And we may say, okay, we're going to see that, and, and that's sad, and it's too bad. But how do I, 2,000 years later, use this truth in my Christian life? I'll tell you how. Jesus, any pain that you've ever been through or ever will go through, Jesus has been there. Jesus has been through it. And when you cry out to him for comfort or for understanding, he's there. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with thing of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. The truth in our passage this morning is that Jesus not only knows the sting of betrayal, but has also left us a perfect example of how to handle it when we find ourselves betrayed. Lord, I want to take a break right now and just ask you, to help us keep our minds focused on you and on the truth, not on our neighbor or on any other distraction. Lord, we need you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Just before I get into the meat of the message, let me, the Lord has laid something on my heart to say. It's not in my notes, but here we go. Like I said, betrayal is an awful thing. When you put your trust in someone and then they do something to destroy that trust, it can destroy you if you let it. There are many folks who grew up in an abusive household or in some other way suffered some terrible injustice where trust was destroyed. It can drive people to the bottle. It can drive people to anger and bitterness. 
it can distort one's ability to ever trust again. Jesus is God and he is perfect, but he is also perfect man. He's human. What we're going to look at in the next few minutes, how he handled this betrayal. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was given for an example for us. Not only how to be selfless and suffer for others, but in every walk of life, he is an example. If you've ever been betrayed, or should I say, when you are betrayed, because we live in a sin-cursed world where that happens. Here is a simple and powerful formula how to, be, how to behave and how to respond when you are betrayed. First of all, Jesus felt the sting of betrayal. Betrayal stings. When Jesus had thus said, now he had just washed the feet of everyone, and he knew that he was washing the feet of his betrayer too. When Jesus had thus said, he was troubled in spirit and testified and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, one of you shall betray me. He was troubled. And, uh, and he testified, he used a solemn witness. All this stresses the extreme seriousness of, of betrayal. Troubled in spirit, is, he was distressed, he was moved, he was disturbed. This false believer who had been compliant on the outside, yet Jesus knew. Jesus said, have not I chosen you twelve, yet one of you is a devil. He didn't say not one of you will become a devil. He, one of you is. One of you is a betrayer. All along, Judas was never real. Judas didn't lose his salvation. Mark that down. You can't lose your salvation. If you're born again, God saved you. You didn't save you. And God can't make a mistake and say, oh, whoops, I lost one. When he saves you, he saves you for real because he's the one that did it, not you. But Judas was never saved. He never lost his salvation. He was troubled. Well, there's a couple of verses in the Bible that uses this same Greek word. When Jesus, therefore, saw her weeping. It's John 11. And Jews also weeping, which came with her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled. John chapter 12 and verse 27. My soul is troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause came I unto this hour. He's crying out to God and his, he's thinking about the crucifixion and his soul was troubled, agitated. And brings us back. He was troubled in spirit and testified, Verily, verily, I say unto you that one of you shall betray me. He testified. It's all about building the disciples' faith right now. This is why he related the word of God. When the disciples saw all this fulfilled, it would make their faith stronger. You say, you don't understand what's going on now, but a little bit later you're going to get this. A little bit later you're going to see this was prophesied in the Old Testament. A little bit later this is going to make sense. You're not going to get it now. But he put it all together so that they would be built. The remarkable thing 
is what Jesus did here. I want you to picture what's happening at the table. I, I'm glad, by the way, I think I fall into the same um, trap that a lot of us do. And that is, if I get used to something, and in my culture, that must be the right way to do things. And if your culture does it differently, it's the what? It's the wrong way to do things. Well, that's not true, right? But we can do that. I can think of the way they eat in the uh, ancient culture, and I wouldn't be able to stand eating like this. So, if you've ever seen the scenes, um, or even the, the picture of the Last Supper, you know, the, the, the table was short, short little table, and everybody's sitting around the table in a U on couches, and they're eating reclined. And they recline with their head in the chest or lap of the person next to them. Man, I wouldn't want to be part of that. I make a mess enough of myself when I'm sitting straight up. Anyway. So, the Bible talks about the disciple whom Jesus loved. And John is writing this, um, this account and the disciple whom Jesus loved, that phrase is only used in the Gospel of John. So most Bible scholars believe that whenever the writer, John, says the disciple whom Jesus loved, he's talking about himself and, and didn't really want to use his own name. You know. So the disciple whom Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus leaning on him. And Peter was removed a bit. Guess who was on the other side of Jesus? Right next to Jesus. Judas. I want you to think about that. Everything's real close. Real intimate. We have John, Jesus, Judas. Oof. Now, the remarkable thing here is the communication that happened at the table. The Bible tells us that Peter wanted to get John to ask Jesus who it was that was going to betray him. Jesus said, someone's going to betray you. Betray me. And the best we could tell is the way it worked is that Peter was, and Peter and John, they were tight, right? But Peter was across the room a bit. Best we could tell, Peter, Peter shoots John a look. Like, ask him. So, John is leaning on Jesus' breast. Looks up. Says, Lord, who is it? And Jesus said, it's the one to whom I give sop. Now, I've always read and looked at this as all of this was a big conversation that everybody heard. It's not. This was quiet. The only person 
that knew the answer was John, and John didn't completely understand. Warren Wiersbe says the remarkable thing is that others at the table with Jesus did not know that Judas was an unbeliever and a traitor. And up to the very hour of his treachery, Judas was protected by the Savior whom he betrayed. What do you think would have happened with Peter Two Swords if it had been publicly made known that Judas was the betrayer? Nobody knew. And Jesus knew why that was a good idea. Jesus knew that it would happen, but he also knew who would do it. And he treated everybody the same anyway. So what's our lesson? We don't know who's going to betray us until they do. But once they do, how do we handle it? Jesus already knew, and how did he handle it? He loved Judas anyway. And we're going to see the depth of that love in a little bit. The Bible says, The Lord knoweth the thoughts of men, they are vanity. He knew what Judas was thinking. The disciples were perplexed. They became nervous and self-conscious when Jesus exposed the betrayer. The disciples had no idea and were completely unaware of the deserter. Remember in another passage, it says when he says, somebody's going to desert us, what did the disciples start asking? Lord, is it me? By the way, that wouldn't have been my question. My question is, is it him? Or is it him? But no. The disciples were in such a state of shock and intimacy with Christ, and they had learned enough to love each other, they couldn't, and they learned enough about grace that the first person that they would suspect would be themselves. which is intense. Jesus not only knew about the betrayal, Jesus refused to return the betrayer, the re betrayal. Now, here's where I think it's it's just incredible. It is, if I knew that someone was going to betray me, my first fleshly reaction would be to out them and put them on social media and dox them and make sure everybody knew where they lived and what their phone number is and how to get a hold of them and what their social security number is. <laughs> I'm going to out them. They're going to betray me. Well, guess what? Two can play at that game, right? And, and, and certainly our flesh feels like that. If you've ever been betrayed, we feel like that. But our Savior did it different. He just, the only reason he said someone's going to betray me is to brace the disciples for the storm about to come. Not for them to take vengeance on the betrayer. Not to expose and shame the betrayer, but simply to say, get ready, a storm is coming. Look it. The disciples looked one to another, doubting of whom he spake. 
There was one leaning on Jesus' breast or bosom, one of whom, uh, his disciples whom Jesus loved. Simon Peter, therefore, beckoned to him that he should ask who it should be of whom he spake. And that beckon to him, that's, that's the, you know, he didn't ask him straight outright. He's shooting him this look across the room, saying, find out, find out what it is. I want you to see the tenderness here. Jesus didn't name Judas as the traitor, not vocally. He wanted Judas to still get a chance. Jesus drew Judas close to his side. Apparently, he asked Judas to sit next to him on the other side. He was close enough so that Jesus could reach out his hand and give sop. And a sop is you take a piece of bread and you, and you dip it in, in the, the wine and you hand it to the person. And I want you to understand something. In that culture, the head of the feast, and Jesus was at the head, he was at the head of the table. If the head of the feast offered a little morsel dipped, that was a sign of honor. Jesus knew that Judas would betray him with a kiss, and Jesus gave him a sign of honor for John to know who it was that we're talking about. Everybody else, though, saw this as a sign of honor. Nobody at the table thought what was going on. And Jesus gave very special attention to Judas. The act of affection was usually uh, actually turned suspicion away from Judas. Jesus seemed to be saying, Judas means something special to me. And Jesus identified Judas, but only to John, and John didn't fully grasp what was happening. Jesus revealed that he was betrayed and also the who. Now, John was stunned by the revelation, but before he could say or do anything, Jesus sent Judas on his way. But I want you to get something here. Well, we'll get this in a minute, I guess. What do we learn so far? Betrayal stings, okay? And Jesus didn't react in kind. And lastly, and this is huge. Jesus gave one more chance to repent. Look at verse 26. Jesus answered, He it is whom I should give a sop when he have dipped it. When he dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. I got to believe Judas heard it. Who's going to betray me? The one who I dip a sop. He's just talking to John on this side. Judas heard on this side. So he dipped sop. And he hands it to Judas. And he looks him in the eye. Judas hadn't done it yet. Judas hadn't betrayed him yet. Jesus knew that that was on his heart. Judas, uh, Jesus knew that was the direction. But Jesus, rather than saying, it's Judas, everybody. He said to John, the one who I dipped up. John not quite understanding. He hands it to Judas. Judas is right next to him. 
Judas heard that. Jesus looks him in the eye and gives him some. And Judas didn't change his direction. He could have. It was one more chance. It was one more chance to change direction. One more chance to stop what he's doing. But he didn't. And the Bible says, after the sop, Satan entered into him. Now let's pause there for a second. He was giving Judas one more chance to stop. And he didn't stop. Once he didn't stop, once he didn't resist. The Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee. Once he didn't resist, then he became one of two people that we know in the Bible that was ever Satan-possessed. Do you know that there are only two people in the Bible that are Satan-possessed? A bunch of people demon-possessed. But only Judas and the, uh, the Antichrist during Daniel 73. They're the only people in the Bible that have been Satan possessed. And Satan possessed Judas when Judas refused to take that one last chance to repent. No man at the table knew for what intent he spake unto this unto him. Some of them thought because Judas had the bag that Jesus said, now go buy those things that you have need against the feast, or that you should give something to the poor. He then, having received the sop, went immediately out, and it was night. The sop was the sign. John knew, didn't understand. Judas knew. And here's the deal. At that point, Jesus said, what you do, what thou doest, do quickly. Go. Get on with it if you're going to do it. Get it over with. The whole scene, it's all, all its descriptive drama and tragedy is a picture of strong appeal. Appeal of the Lord to a man who is about to sell his soul for the goods of the world. A picture of the last chance being given to a betrayer. It was the last chance that Judas would ever have to repent. Be no more opportunities. Perhaps you're here today teetering on the edge of bad and destructive. And the Lord knows it. And it's trying to spiritually grab you by the ears and shake you and say, listen, don't carry this out. Don't follow through. This is your last chance before you do something that is irreversible. It may be that the Lord has brought you here to hear this message because you've been betrayed. And the sting of that betrayal threatens to upend your whole life. Learn from the Savior who's been through more than what you're going through. He knows the sting, but he knew not to return it. Betrayal for betrayal. And he served as being ready for repentance at any point. These are the lessons we can learn 
from the one who was betrayed. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Nobody's looking around. If you were to say, you know what, Pastor? The Lord's touched my heart. There are some things here that I need to respond to. Would you pray for me as I try to get some things right? Anybody like that, would you raise your hand? Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for the hands. Thank you, Lord, for the hearts. God, I ask you that you would help us to learn from this truth. Thank you for the incredible love of our Savior, and the incredible um, example. Help us to follow that. In Jesus' name, amen. In number four.